let's get underway, guys. Uh, welcome, everybody from all over the world. Uh, apologies that I'm only doing this in English. Connor's going to do it in Hungarian, and <laughs> Fiona's going to do it in Russian. Uh, uh, it is wonderful to have so many people joining us from all over the world. Uh, my name is Ross Solly. I'm your um, host, but I will be talking very little tonight because we've got two of the biggest names in world stand-up paddling joining us, which we're really, really lucky and, and grateful for them giving up their time. Both uh, world title holders, of course, uh, they need little introduction, but for those who maybe are not that familiar, Connor Baxter, uh, of course, has been paddling for, well, we don't want to say how many years now, Connor? <laughs> A few. Yeah. Um, yep, and joining us from California and Fiona Wild, joining us from... Oregon. Oregon, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful that you guys have joined us on your Sunday lunchtime, I suppose, for you guys. Yeah. So that's yeah. great. Um, so for the next hour or so, everybody, we are going to be listening to Fiona and Connor. They're going to give us some tips on various things to do with stand-up paddling. Um, as Connor mentioned, we are recording this session, so we will post it online uh, in a few days' time, and um, please, uh, if you've got a friend that might find this interesting or you want to go back and relive the best moments, then uh, that will be available for you. You can ask questions. Uh, Connor and Fiona are both happy to answer questions. The best way to do this, in fact, the only way to do this, really, is to go to the Q&A button. On the bottom of your screen, you'll see Q&A. If you click on that, you can type in a question. Uh, and then the, the trick is that if you see a question there that you really like and would like to have answered, if you like that question, then the more likes the question gets, the higher it gets in the, uh, in the list. Um, and so we will work our way down through the most popular questions uh, when time permits, which we will make time for questions. So please, uh, fire away with any questions you like to do with stand-up paddling, with preparation for stand-up paddling, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, and we've got more uh, uh, forums coming up too in, the, in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you go to our webpage, you'll see all the details. We've got uh, a couple of other world champions, uh, Sonny Honschild and uh, Michael Booth will be joining us for a, for, a, um, for a session. It's going to be really, really interesting. And I should just say, before we uh, move on, a big thank you to Starboard um, for their support for this and for stand-up paddling in general. They're big, big supporters of the sport. And we will be, be without them, Connor and Fiona. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Fiona. She's going to kick this off. Uh, please, everyone, um, enjoy and uh, fire those questions in. And I'll be back with you very soon. Fiona, the ball is in your court. Cool. Well, thank you all so much. And um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Connor and Ross, and the entire paddling community that's here right now. It's um, I don't know. I get super excited, you know, when we get the chance to talk and chat and meet. But of course, with this year, we can't do that. So um, doing something like this is pretty darn special. So I want to take us just a moment today and talk about race preparation and talk about um, what it means, what you need to do, what it means to get outside and get ready to go race, whether that is your first race or whether you competed um, in multiple different world championships or anything like that. So I like to break it down in two different sections. There's the physical aspect to getting ready to race and there's the mental aspect to getting ready to race. And all the things that I'm gonna mention today you can, you know, put more effort into them or, you know, take it and step it down a notch. It doesn't really matter, but you just need to find what's best for you. And so today I'm going to give you a few tips to help making that introduction to racing a little bit easier. So with the physical part, there's three really important aspects. There's training, rest and recovery, and nutrition. And I think that in any sport, that's kind of the equation that goes into having a solid performance out in the water. Few things that I like to do when I'm thinking about training would be, okay, what are the conditions that I'm gonna be competing in, most likely on the race course? Um, and with that, train in those conditions and any other condition that you have near your house. Because even if it's a flat water race, there is a chance that you could have a windy, stormy day and it's not gonna be a flat water race when it comes to race day. So it's super important to train for that specific race, but then also to train in, train in some waves, train upwind, train downwind, train in sidewind, train in super technical stuff because 
I think Connor and I can both agree that even if it's a long flat water race, there's going to be some super technical moments where you need to be able to respond super fast. Totally. Yeah. So it's just like any, any little advantage you have to respond quickly, that's going to help you later on in the race. And that comes from being comfortable in a big variety of different conditions to paddle in. The other thing that I like to do is I like to train on the board that I'm going to be racing on. Um, you know, when Connor and I are traveling, we, we send our boards ahead of time to the races, but we also make sure that we have boards at home. So if we're training at home, we're going to be training on that same board that is going to be the board we're going to be racing on. So a lot of times when you're doing the Euro tour and stuff like that, if I know I'm going to be racing on the sprint, I'm going to be training at home on the sprint. And I'm going to be training with the same fin that I'll be racing on um, over in Europe. And then the same thing goes for you know, any other race too. Um, it just, that helps, helps their confidence just to like know how a board is going to perform and how it's going to feel on the water. The other thing that is super helpful is creating a plan when it comes to that race course. Okay. So you go out there, it's part of that physical training is getting your body used to the distance and the style of racing that you're most likely going to be in. So, you know, if you're, if you're doing a 10K race, it doesn't really help you to only train short sprints. But at the same time, you need a variety of training. You need a variety of different um, skills for that 10K. You need your start, which is a short sprint. You need to be able to get into like a mid-distance, you know, higher paddle cadence, um, comfortable pace and then you're going to probably need some technical stuff you're going to need some buoy turns um, you're going to need to be able to pay attention some small, small little skills here and there so that would be the training the physical training aspect that i would look into in terms of like okay what am i going to do to get my body ready those are the things that i would do on the water with the board none of that is helpful if you don't recover properly and actually, Connor is the king of recovery. I have learned so much from Connor from traveling. Um, whenever we've been at events, he'll come out and he has like full on recovery gear for health training. So he'd be so much better at explaining all that than I would be. But I like to keep it simple. I like to keep it simple in terms of stretching, um, in terms of making sure that you're getting enough rest, whether that be in between travel or whether that be, you know, taking a nap in between training sessions. Um, but one of the biggest things that I like to do when I'm recovering is to try and just slow the mind down. Try not to freak out about everything else that's going on. And I like to take that moment, a bit of quiet time, to plan the next training session too. It gives me a moment to reflect back on the last training session and also look forward to the next one. And then I would say with all of that, the third part of physical training is your nutrition. And everybody does nutrition differently. Um, same thing goes. Connor and I, we, we travel the same races, we've won the exact same races, and I can tell you we've eaten completely different breakfast that same morning. <laughs> you know, and, and that's totally okay, totally fine. So the thing that I would say for nutrition is you need to find your nutrition. You know, you need to find your diet that works for you and try and stick to that as best you can. The other thing you don't really want to do is you don't want to think, oh no, I'm getting into a race, you know, I need to be healthy, I need to, I need to look more fit, so I'm going to change my diet two weeks out from a race. Your body's not going to know how to handle all of that and handle that change so quickly to a race. So just go into it, find your diet, find your healthy diet, stick to that, and the other thing, stay hydrated. And those two things can help you immensely. And the other thing, or the last thing that I would say with nutrition is plan your nutrition for your race. Because one, you're racing, um, you know, maybe for shorter technical races, you wouldn't bring a hydration pack or electrolytes. But for any longer distance stuff, it's really important. Anything over like 45 minutes, um, 45 minutes would be the maximum that I would paddle without electrolytes in my hydration pack. And anything above that, I definitely have electrolytes and some sort of um, fast acting. Um, well, I have it because I have diabetes, but also in general, it's just good to have food with you. And it's super good to practice that in your trainings and not wait until race day to be like, oh, today, yeah, I need food while I'm paddling. And 
it's an extra step. It does take time to drink water. It takes time to eat something while you're paddling. So um, definitely want to go ahead and do all of that while you're in your training. Connor, is there anything you want to add for the physical part of training? Yeah, totally. I think there's a lot to digest there and there's a lot of key little factors that I really picked up on and just kind of want to circle back to those just so people really understand. But yeah, training, I think for any sport, any athlete, there's a lot that goes into it on the water, off the water, and you really got to really prepare yourself mentally and physically before a race. So all these things that, um, that Fiona, you were talking about are really good and important to involve. I think, uh, my biggest thing were some of the things you mentioned, nutrition and recovery have been two things I focused on just because at the end of the day, we're doing all the same training. We're doing those sprints. We're doing those one minute, almost throw up and take your rest, you know, but at the end of the day, if I'm recovering faster, I'm able to go put in a hundred percent into my next training. So whether it's stretching, meditation, um, or if you have access to fun recovery devices, like I, I was showing with Fiona on some of our events, the Norma Tech and things like that to help speed up the recovery process, it's really key to add into your routine. And this is not just for race day, like Fiona is saying, it's really good to get in a habit of practicing these things on the water, off the water, before events, after events, and just to get in a habit of doing these things. So when it comes to comp competition, you don't have to think about it. It just is happening naturally. You're rolling into stretching, you're rolling into meditating, and then your competition is already here. So those are really good key points to really focus on. And like you said as well, everyone, whether it comes to our technique or our nutrition, everyone works different. So tuning into different things to find what foods work for you and what foods you kind of thrive on. Cause what can be my superfood could really affect you. Like I thrive on pasta the night before and having a big bowl of pasta, whereas you not necessarily do so well. On pasta. So finding those things that work for you specifically and then training with them and loading up on those kind of things is really important. But yeah. uh, looking over here at the questions, I think uh, answering a few of these would be fun just because yeah. I'm looking Pop at one that right first here. one. Yeah. Besides yeah. paddling, what else do you do for competition? Do you do so any other ones? I, like, I do, definitely. Um, I will fully admit that um, paddling, obviously, that's a major part of my training because my focus is to train for paddling um, and paddling competitions, whether it be surfing and racing. Um, stand up paddling, that's the focus. But um, I love doing all sorts of different sports, and I always have. So my favorite thing is outdoors. I do go to the gym and do specific um, gym trainings. A lot of them are dynamic and, you know, to get um, muscles firing a bit faster. So I'm not super into heavy weights, um, but I do a lot of plyometric stuff at the gym and on the track um, here at the local high school. But the biggest thing that I would say I do for cross training would be running. I love um, outdoor trail running. That's definitely my favorite. Mountain biking. And then I windsurf and spend a lot of time on a sailboat. So those things, um, A, being outside. Trail running is awesome. You know, it helps with your cardio. You know, it helps with your balance and your agility. Same thing with mountain biking. And then sailing, whether it be windsurfing or sailing on a big board, it's sailing tactics, time on the water, um, understanding wind shifts, how water moves in different directions, all of those little things. Um, and yeah, <laughs> those would be my like four things to go for. What about you? Yeah, same. I think cross training has to be one of the most important things and definitely an underlying kind of missing from a lot of people's training. For me personally, I know the last few years, I really tried to just tune in and focus just on paddling. And it almost got me into a rut in the sense like when it got to competition day, I'm like, oh, I got to go paddle again. Where if you are throwing curveballs, going to the gym, doing functional training, which is something I do a lot as well, not heavy lifting, obviously looking at me compared to Michael Booth or Danny Ching, I don't have those deadlifting, big muscle bench pressing. But I think the jumping around and like, functional training, using your body weight, push-ups, pull-ups, those things 
are working muscles that you necess not necessarily would work on paddling. Paddling is a lot of pulling motion, a lot of, a lot of that. So when I get on land, I'm going to do a lot of pushing motion to work the opposite direction of all those muscles on the water pulling all day long. And then same with other sports, windsurfing, whether it be surfing or anything like that, maybe it's not as high as cardio or as long as you would want to go for if you're training for a marathon, but you're seeing different things when you're on different equipment. So when you're on a surfboard, you're looking for swell, you're looking for where to be, where not to be. And then when you're on a paddleboard, then you can utilize that. Whereas if your head's down and you're just paddling, you're not necessarily going to be seeing those bumps or those little things. And uh, during this pandemic, I think that's been the biggest thing since we haven't had as many competitions for us here in the U.S. It's been a lot more play, jump on the wing, go foiling, go have some fun and just, uh, you know, be a kid again. Because at the end of the day, we have such a structured lifestyle being an athlete or whether you're working a job, you have this nine to five or this, and to break out of that a little bit and have a little bit of fun, I think it's a really key thing to my training and keeping me young and keeping me going and sustainable for this long. And it keeps paddling fun too. You know, like you said, it, for me, when I go off mountain biking and then I come down and see that it's windy or even if it's glassy, it's like, okay, sweet. Now I'm going to go paddling. It brings that, that excitement. It keeps you going. It's like, oh, wait, you know, when you're, when you're doing a new sport and you're learning skills, it brings back that fun of like, oh, I'm, I'm learning, I'm improving. Like, okay, now I want to take this to paddling, even though, you know, we're at a professional level and we want, you know, we race against the best in the world. Hey, he does There's too. There's a drop <laughs> that you guys probably weren't expecting, but we're here in yep. California, so you get to see a little bit of Danny Ching as well. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you got about 400 people or so asking oh, wow. us all these questions and checking us all out. So, yeah. Danny keeps it fun. Corner. There's someone else coming in the background too, so it's an open house. <laughs> Uh, what you about know, you, know, you got to keep everyone on their toes. You got to keep them on their toes. <laughs> what about this question um, about shoulder pain and shoulder injury, which obviously a lot of people are asking questions about? Um, have you both had those sorts of injuries, and, and how do you deal with them or avoid them? Yeah, I think that's a, a big one for for me. I think coming from a windsurfing surfing background i was really not totally tuned in with paddling correctly utilizing the right muscles and things like that so shoulder playing was a big one and i think something that really helped me was paddling and paddling for me was too long of a paddle you're using more leverage and in that sense i was finding the double shaka over your head or that too long of stroke i was choking down to save my shoulders and you know give it a little bit of break because there's less leverage so that could be one thing to tune into is uh, shortening your blade a little bit and using less leverage using more of your hips and that foundation of the stroke and then on top of it is uh, playing around with different blades and shaft stiffnesses I know Fiona you've done a lot of that with the starboard lineup going with thinner diameter softer smaller and those are things that are totally yeah, so um, I'm 5'2", so I'm relatively short. Um, but at the same time, I don't use the same stiffness paddle shaft that Connor does. I use a smaller blade because it just wouldn't make sense. If I were to go ahead and use Connor's paddle, even if I cut it down to my height, I would just be like, my shoulders would be gone. <laughs> they wouldn't be left. So I've, I've worked a lot with Starboard to make a paddle shaft specifically um, that is less stiff. So when I put that paddle in the water, there's a lot more give. So instead of me just having to yard back on the paddle shaft there, I make sure that I have a shaft that gives a bit of bend. So there's a little bit of, um, it's, it almost gives my shoulders like a moment to relax, to set into the blade before I go ahead and pull it back through the water. And those things, those, that has helped me so much. Um, because I used to paddle super um, stiff shafts and, you know, I'd be fine for shorter races, but anything over an hour, um, I'd be really, really tired and sore. Um, my shoulders down into my back. And so same with Connor, I actually have shortened um, my paddle. And so I'm using a, a much shorter paddle now. And that with the correct stiffness, if you go, you know, if it's, 
if it's too loosey goosey and you know you you pull back on it and the whole paddle bends then you really don't get you know the full stroke out of it that you're hoping to but if you can go ahead and you know you you feel like you're getting solid connection with the water when you go ahead and pull back on your paddle and it doesn't feel like you're hurting your shoulder that's that happy medium there and the blade size too you know i would suggest to you know if you're having shoulder problems go one blade size smaller you know and if you if you want to go ahead and uh you know work your way up that's a really good way to start but start small and then as you as you paddle more often you get you you build up more strength and then you can go ahead and increase your increase your blade size and another one for the length uh something i played around with as well is going with an adjustable so if you have a access to an adjustable paddle in one session you can test five different lengths out and be like wow i went really long i felt it a lot in my shoulders and then i went really short and then i started feeling it in my lower back so playing around with different lengths different blades stiffnesses if you have the access to that if there's a demo shop around you i think it's really key to fine tune exactly what you're wanting and on top of it starting smaller like you were saying fiona and growing up into that is really key because if you go to the gym and grab the 200 pound dumbbells to lift up, you're going to throw your shoulder out. <laughs> the so same thing. You're not going to go and grab Dave Kalama's big mama QB paddle and try to go do <laughs> distance race. So starting small, working your way up and building a stronger foundation would be really important. Okay. Yeah. Fiona, I think you probably want, we'll get you back to your presentation in just a moment. But um, as we both know, there are a lot of people on this watching this webinar who are quite new to the sport. So uh, wonderful opportunity to tap into the minds of both both of you. Uh, a question here, which is very popular, is that people are looking for an explanation about the fins. Are they important? And uh, should you look for different fins for different conditions, different training? Yeah, they definitely are important. Um, Connor and I both ride for a Black Project. And so even within the Black Project line, there's a lot of different styles of fins, styles and within each style, there's different sizes as well. Um, right now we have the Tiger, the Sonic and Condor and Connor can definitely take you off on the Condor. Um, but yes, different fins react differently in different water conditions. Um, if you think of it as, well, here, let's think of it like this. You know, you're going on a, you're going for a bike ride and you're biking to the grocery store to pick up some milk. You could just use a full on cruiser bike, you know, no problem, whatever. Well, even if you're biking there and it's on pavement, you're good to go. It doesn't really matter whatever tires you use. But think of it as, you know, you're taking that same cruiser bike and to get to the grocery store, you have to go down a gravel path. You don't really want to take your road bike on that. If you're going to the grocery store and you have to go up and down all these hills and around and stuff like that, you might want a mountain bike. Your same cruiser bike could work, but the tires would be different. And it's pretty similar when it comes to stand-up paddling and stand-up paddle racing with your fins. You can use pretty much any of your boards in the same water conditions, but you want to adjust the fin so you can have the most traction and the most stability and then therefore the most speed. So when I come to flat water racing, I really like to look at um, the Black Project Tiger because it has, you know, it's gonna have good stability, good traction, and you know, it's gonna be fast. When it comes for downwinding, I like the Sonic and the Condor. And Connor can explain a little bit more on those, how they go ahead and like allow a lot more flexibility and maneuverability. Yeah, for sure. I think that those are like underlying three things you're looking for is stability, tracking, and maneuverability. So when I go into a race, if it's going to be a straight line 200 meter sprint, I want something that's going to hold me into a straight line. I can do the whole 200 meters paddling on my left side, not having to switch at all. So I want a little bit bigger fin, find something that's going to be tracking a little bit better for me versus when we went to the technical race the next day, for instance, if we're looking at the ICF Worlds uh, last year, I then put in the Sonic or the Condor, which is a little bit smaller diameter, a little bit smaller depth into the water. So I'm having to take a few more strokes on each side, switching a little bit more, but I'm allowed to beach start, put my board into the water a little bit sooner. When I get to the buoy, I'm gonna be able to flip the buoy turn a little bit easier and things like that. So fins do make a big difference. At the end of the day, if you find something that works for you, you can put it in the board and your board's gonna go. So that is the beauty of it, but you can get a little more fine tuned 
and some special features like carbon, lighter, uh, you know, you're going to reduce a little bit of the weight and things like that. But the three things you want to be looking for is stability, tracking, and maneuverability. And then, of course, lining that up with what race you're going to be doing. And somebody else just popped up here asking about fin placement. And really, that varies a lot depending on the board. So, you know, Connor and I can put our put the fins in the same spot for our all-stars, but then we're going to have to put it in a slightly different spot for a sprint or if you're on a different uh, board company as well. Um, and that, that just takes some time. That takes some practice. And really, it comes down to feel because it doesn't really matter what, you know, your training buddy says and where he or she puts his fin. But if it feels good to you, then go for that. That's a good rule of thumb when it comes to any type of lessons, clinics, whether you're working on technique or this or that. Everyone has a different structure, body mechanics. So playing around with stuff is definitely going to give you the most feel for everything. And then you're going to fine tune like, okay, that one was too big. This one was too small. This one's feeling a little bit better. Okay, let's kind of go on this kind of side of things. So playing around with equipment is key. Switching with your friends when you're on the water and uh, just trying as much product as possible. Absolutely. So let's take it in real quick before we get into Connor's more technical side of stand-up paddling. The second biggest part, which actually this should really be the first part of race preparation, and that's the mental side. Getting yourself ready mentally. There's two things, two really big things that are part of the mental side, in my opinion. The first, that's creating confidence. And there's a lot of different ways that you can create confidence when it comes to getting ready for a race, when it comes to traveling for a race, preparing, all of these things. But the first thing that I like to think of is just positive, positive, positive. Like surround yourself with positivity, you know, think positively, um, you know, know your conditions that you're going to be traveling in and or competing in. But at the same time, like when you wake up in the mirror, look in the mirror and say, hi, how's it going? Good morning. I can do this, you know, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do it today. Um, so that, that is one of the biggest things. And then you can, you know, once you have that relationship created with yourself, you can break it down and apply that positive approach to the race course. So, you know, know the race course that you're going to be paddling, know which buoys you have to go. Um, there's somebody down here who says more training, more success. Excellent. And I think that comes with both sides. You know, you have to do your physical training, but your physical training doesn't do much if you don't have the mental aspect to support it. And that's why I say that the mental side is so important. So know the risk. For sure, the mental side, because I've uh, had so many times where I have groups of training partners, groups of buddies that are paddling. And on that day of training, we're neck and neck pushing each other. But then when it comes, push comes to show the day of the competition. They're nowhere up towards the top, you know, and that's when it comes to that mental side of things. And yeah. my kind of feel too is same thing. It's that telling yourself, I can do this. I got this being prepared, having the training under your belt. So when you go into it saying, I've done the work now, I just have to focus on today. And the big thing too, is almost when it does come to that Friday time, the night before is then letting it all go having the week to prepare for it and mentally visualizing yourself crossing that line, mentally, physically seeing yourself fall into the water, come back on your board and getting back up to the top pack and having the good and bad is really important. But then when it's Friday night, turning all of that off, because that is a lot of energy that it's just going in your mind over and over and over. And that can run you down too. So there's a fine line of doing too much and then shutting it all off and then just allowing saying, you know what, I got this. I know what to do. I've done this before. Now, Connor, those, perfect. Here, yeah, sorry, Fiona. I was just going to jump in just while we're talking about that. Uh, a lot of people struggle to sleep before big events because it gets too much from... Do, do either of you have routines or something to help you prepare? Or do you just not stress about a lack of sleep before a big event? Depending on the day and what event, for sure. Um, but I think a big thing would be, yeah, like shutting that brain off if possible and just like saying, okay, I've done everything I could do. Night of rest. I need to get some good rest tonight. So shutting that off. Luckily for me, I'm a pretty deep, good sleeper. So I haven't struggled with it too much. But there's definitely been those nights or those days that you, you know, got the butterflies and you're thinking about it nonstop. I would totally agree. You know, it's, um, I'm also 
kind of like a bear when I sleep. It's <laughs> don't really hear anything going on, <laughs> kind of like hibernation. But at the same time, you know, I have had my nights of tossing and turning before a race, especially if it's a big one and it's a final race, um, you know, or there's a world title on the line. Like those are, those are nerve wracking times. Um, but I think it's just important to, you know, take a deep breath, focus, um, focus, but also just try and relax. You know, when you go about your day, you don't really think about things, you know, on a normal day, you just do it. And I think that's what um, I try to remind myself is it's like, I know how to paddle. I know how to do a start. And you know, that that's just what I need to do tomorrow. And that, that will come into it. And the biggest thing is to remember that you love paddling and you're going to go out and do something that you absolutely love. You're going to go have fun with it and just try and enjoy it. And that kind of comes into my second part of um, the mental part of training. And that's plan for something to go wrong because yeah. we all have that happen. You know, it doesn't matter. Like I've, I've had, you know, also if you're nervous, sometimes it's easy to forget something or, you know, overthink something or, I don't know, maybe somebody accidentally drops some things on your board, you know, and puts a hole in it or whatever it is that doesn't go to plan as you thought of it. The most important thing is to not let that stress you out, not let that work you up um, and actually try and look for an opportunity in that. You know, it's like whether it's on the race course, if you fall in, you know, or if you lose a draft train or something terrible happens, um, you know, or if it's on the beach before the race, no matter what it is, it's like, okay, this is all right. What's the problem? How can I fix it? How can I use it to my advantage? And when you have that into your equation already, going into the race course, being able to prepare, respond quickly, um, that's gonna help you immensely on race day. Also just to calm the nerves too. For sure, always prepare for the worst and expect the best. I think that's a good rule of thumb for sure. You never know, because I think, I don't even know if I've had one race that went perfectly as planned or like exactly how I envisioned it. So definitely preparing for falls and those kind of things. And that's a nut that goes back into your training. Like, are you training perfect in environment or are you trying to push your comfort zone? Are you paddling in when it's cold or when it's windy or if it's big surf and kind of every day trying to make that 1% better, that 1% gain, whether it's physical or mental? Yeah, absolutely. Well, those are kind of the things that I would wrap up just to give a, I know there's a ton of information, but on the physical side, you know, training, hours, hours on the water, that's going to help you. Rest and recovery is super important, and none of that works if you're not feeling your body in a healthy way that suits you. So keep that in mind. And then on the mental side, create your own confidence. You know, look yourself in the mirror and tell yourself that you can do it. And the other thing, you know, plan for something to go wrong and know that you can create an opportunity out of something that just seems impossible. Yeah, so. totally. It looks like another top question up here for sprinting. And that's and all you, Connor. We both like <laughs> it, but I'm, I'm no. over to you now, Connor. Thank, thank you, Fiona. But Fiona, please uh, stay on. I'm sure you'll have things you can add to um, to Connor's presentation. And then there are a whole list of questions there that I'm sure you will be able to answer much better than Connor can answer. <laughs> so uh, please that's stay on. But, uh, Yes, Connor, you can talk about sprint racing. And also, Connor, we've got a lot of questions there about the subject you're going to talk about today, and that is turning. Um, yeah, so those were the, the two big ones I wanted to talk about today. And we'll jump right into it with sprinting. And uh, the biggest thing for sprinting is, honestly, time being uncomfortable. I think that same with distance and same with that, but actually training your muscles to get the fast twitch muscles going. Because now more than ever, you're seeing the sport really start to focus in you got the Michaels, the Sonys, and those people that are pretty much purely doing distance racing and focusing on bettering themselves in that zone. And then you got the Caspers and the Claudio Nicas and those kind of guys and myself that are kind of tuning, in, <laughs> tuning into sprinting and more the technical side. And I think that's a big thing is really trying to find what you're interested in and what really excites you because at the end of the day, when I get on the start line for a technical race or a sprint race, I'm jumping up and down, so ready to go for it. Whereas when I get on the start line for a distance, I'm not as excited about it. I'm not as thrilled about it. So being excited about it is huge. But as far as some of the training that goes down, 
I think uh, uh, one line that Larry Kane kind of always gave me is like, if you're not almost throwing up, you're not going hard enough. So that's a pretty good rule of thumb when you're going and training. And those are one minute on four minute rest days where you're just going eight to 10 times all out for one minute, coming back to the beach, resting completely, and then going right back at it. And then as far as technique, I've really tried to tune into the technique side of things and utilize what I have as far as my body mechanics, my length, and not huge muscles, but I have the fast twitch muscle mechanism going and really keeping that cadence up. And if you guys saw the video from the 200 meter in China, you can really notice that my catch of the stroke and that really that beginning part of the stroke is really where I'm emphasizing on and I'm not pulling full strokes through the entire way from nose to tail. It's kind of just tapping in front of my board, keeping the cadence up, really loading that top hand on the handle to catch, bury the blade. And then as soon as the blade is buried, it's coming back up for the next stroke. And uh, those kind of things, it's definitely a little bit easier to see it and kind of paddle and do it versus like uh, trying to explain it over the, the video as well. But the key thing to focus on is your catch, trying to really bury the blade, get that out and repetition. So high cadence, really hard, on the heart and the lungs you'll feel it burning for sure and that's really where you're going to get the most gains out of sprinting whereas if you're pulling full strokes through the water you're not going to be able to get that board up onto a plane as quick and then you're maybe have the chance of you know not being up in the top lead it's not to say that once your board is depending on what board you're on for me an all-star i'm pretty much maintaining that high rpms to keep the board on top of the surface some of these displacement hall boards, you can utilize that 10, 15 strokes to get your board up onto a plane and then you're settling into a longer stroke and maintaining that speed. And uh, that's all to do with, yeah, your gear, how you paddle in particular, and um, what you're training for in specific. But um, it seems like, yeah, that was a few of the tips for faster sprinting. I think equipment has changed a lot over the years as well. I've gone with a shorter paddle. So now I'm up in the length, right about eyebrow level or head high level is where my top of my handle is. And I've gone with a bigger blade and a stiffer shaft, just because we're going so short and you're just trying to tap the water. So the bigger blade allows me, if I miss a stroke or I don't bury it perfectly, I still have a large surface area of that blade touching the water. Whereas if I had a smaller blade, I'd have to be focusing a little more on burying and kind of getting the whole surface area of my paddle wet. So now with starboard, I'm using the Lima, which is an extra large and about my height. And I'm about six feet. So in centimeters, I'm not too sure, but <laughs> it, us Americans we use that. And um, yeah, those would be my two biggest tips for, for um, sprinting. Any uh, on your side, Fiona? Well, Connor, you are definitely the <laughs> sprint master here. Um, no, I think the biggest thing, though, is making sure that you're really not following through too much for every paddle stroke. Um, you know, you get that blade out in front, you put that blade in the water and, you know, kind of rule of thumb for longer distance. Well, actually, in general, for the sport, you never want to pull your paddle past your feet. But I would say, at least when I'm sprinting, that sprint stroke is about half. Um, I'll, actually minimum is about half um, of what I would normally be doing for the length of a stroke. So it's just, you want to get super high cadence, you know, um, minimize your motions as much as possible. I think it's really important, and Connor does an incredible job of this, of keeping his paddle going straight up and down rather than dropping his top arm out a lot. Just because, you know, as the more you drop your top hand out a lot, that means your paddle is coming further out to the side during your recovery rather than going straight up and down. And any time that you drop your hand further, that just means more time before you can get it back up into your reach um, and catch your paddle again. So yeah, super short strokes and just basically efficiency of movement. Um, you know, reduce the amount of extra movements going on. So all your energy, cause it's gonna take every drop plus a lot more, <laughs> um, you know, of your energy when you're sprinting. So just try and, consolidate everything and for training on that side just to be making sure if you're giving it a hundred percent uh for a minute 40 seconds whatever it is to try to double your resting time so 
really key, and I think that's where you get the most gains out of your sprint training, is that rest because your heart rate's getting up high over your threshold, and then you're bringing it back down, building the lactic acid into your body. So then your body's just getting a little bit more familiar with that feeling. And just like for our races, we're doing a heat where we're going all out and then we're resting for you know 30 minutes until the next round and then boom again all out for 45 seconds to a minute and then resting again so it's really key to put yourself in those situations and also if you are specifically going for a 200 meter sprint if you notice um, the top three guys none of us switch sides so we did the whole 200 meters paddling on our strong side for me that was my left side I chose a more staggered stance. So you're getting a little more similar to the, the sprint kayaker guys where you're leaning forward onto that front foot, burying the blade and almost hopping up onto the next stroke like that. So little things like that are key. Practicing, if you are going longer than 200 meter, practicing switching your paddle really quick, really fast, getting efficient with that. And like you said, Fiona, as less movement as possible. So really planting your feet on the board, getting that solid foundation and then holding that and then just tapping away. Absolutely. I think, I think um, that's just, super. Sorry, Fiona, I was just going to say, uh, a lot of people are posting questions in the chat, which is great, but um, both Connor and Fiona are monitoring the Q&A um, list. So please, if you have questions, go into the Q&A. There's about 40 questions there already. <laughs> We're gonna be in for right. a long day, guys. Um, but uh, please put, post your questions in the Q&A tab. And if your question's already been asked, just like it. And then it'll uh, make its way up towards the top of the, uh, the ladder there. And um, the, the guys have been very good at monitoring the questions as they're coming in and answering them uh, when they get a chance. So uh, yeah. go that way. Sorry, Fiona, I jumped in there. Uh, you were gonna say something. Yeah, no problem. Um, well, it was just a few of the things that I saw pop up here, because uh, we were talking specifically about sprint um, technique, equipment, and somebody asked, would you use the same paddle for a distance? And I would say no, definitely not. Um, Cause your sprint paddle is a lot shorter. I mean, you know, everybody, like we're saying with all this stuff to each their own, but at the same time, um, with sprinting, you're getting super low, you're using your legs a lot. And if you were to try and, you know, sustain a paddle stroke like that over, you know, a two and a half hour race, I think you'd be pretty fatigued really quickly. So I have two different um, length paddles that I use um, when it comes to sprinting, sprint racing and training, and then also distance racing training. And um, they're different blade sizes too. I use a bigger blade when I'm sprinting and a smaller blade when I am um, out doing distance paddles. Yeah, for example, for myself personally, I travel with about four paddles to each competition and that's two on the shorter end, bigger blade for sprinting and technical races, and then two longer ones that are more specific for 10K and up. And why two of each? Because you never know, and that's another preparation thing, is you never know what can happen with travel or day of, and that's one of those things. You don't want to show up with one paddle, and then you come to the day and the paddle is broke or whatever it may be, and that's uh, a good thing to keep in mind. But yeah. looking at some of these questions, um, kind of one thing I was also going to talk about was buoy turning. And Freddie was asking any tips on the weak side of the buoy turn. And that's um, probably one of my specialties. And that's when I would go into the cross bow turning. So a little hard to explain over the video without specifically showing it. But for me, if I'm goofy footed, right foot forward, left foot back, when I jump into that surfer stance going for a pivot turn where I'm sinking my tail on my board and trying to pivot around the buoy, if I'm going to go for a left hand turn, so my chest and my front side is facing the buoy, is that what I normally do is I tend to go a little past the buoy and I'll be paddling on my right side. I hop the paddle over to the left side without switching hands, but more just opening up to the other side and using my blade almost as a fin or a rudder up towards the nose area. And what this allows you to do is if you can pull the blade towards your nose, pulling your board to the left, and then you can hop over the board, continue that stroke as a typical pivot turn. And all these strokes for turning, you're really trying to get that rainbow stroke. So completely opposite of trying to stay in a straight line, keeping the paddle straight up and down. Now we're turning the paddle more to a rake angle and doing a rainbow stroke. So drawing a big rainbow on the water, big arcing bow around the tail of your board. 
and that would be for my weak side. And for my front side turn, pretty straightforward. And my biggest thing I would say is the less movements or the less steps you can do, there's less time for you to mess up. And like a bicycle, you want to keep speed into the buoy turn. So if you get to the buoy and stop all your motion and uh, your momentum, that's when your board gets a little bit tippier, where these boards are designed with speed and keep going. So hit the buoy turn with as much speed as possible. And if you're on a 14 foot board, I tend to do a little baby hop back about board length out. So I'm still, you know, there's probably one or two people in front of me. I'll do a little baby hop back so that when I take the step to the tail or where the kick pad is, it's one big step. Like if I was surfing on a big wave at Piaki Jaws or that's a big step, lowering my center of gravity, my butt goes towards the rail of the board and then the paddle is on the opposite side of me. And then I go back into that rainbow stroke where I'm starting close to my nose and doing a big sweeping arch turn all the way, bringing the blade all the way from my nose, sweeping all the way back to my tail. And that same goes, if you have the blade right touching the rail of your board, you're gonna to have to do three to five strokes in order to spin your board all the way completely around. Versus if you do one big sweeping rainbow turn or rainbow stroke, that's gonna allow you to do one to two strokes and your board will be completely around the board, uh, buoy. Putting your paddle in the water and using it kind of as a break and doing the backward paddle is the most traditional beginner style but then you're losing speed in that sense. So then you're making your board more tippy. And that's when I would go right back to the cross valve and using that as a rudder. So you crossing over to the other side, making sure your arms are not twisting, your chest stays open, you cross to the other side, you bring the paddle towards your nose, up over your board, and then continue that sweeping arch turn. Any there you little, go. I got it. <laughs> guess, you might have a few good ones. You have some pretty sly mongoose turns that I've seen. Yeah, I think the I think the biggest thing is, um, well, there's two things that help when you're doing your buoy turns. Getting super far back on your board is going to allow you to pivot faster. But it's important to remember that the farther back on your board, the less sta stability you have. So you want to limit the amount of time all the way on the back of your board. So if you do, if you get to the back of your board faster, you do your turn and then you get back up to the center line, then you're gonna have the fastest turn and continue with the most stability. Um, and you're gonna be able to come out of the turn with the most speed. Um, the other thing is if you go slow to the back of your board, you're just gonna be a lot more unstable. It's gonna be you know, more likely for you to fall in. So it's super good to practice that. The other thing, while you're practicing walking your feet to the back of your board to get into that surf stance, it's super important to keep your paddle in the water. Your paddle is like an extra brace. So think of your paddle, you know, you're balancing on your two feet, but you also get to use your paddle as a third balance point. So no matter what you're doing, you know, walking forward, walking backwards on your board, always keep your paddle in the water because you can brace against it and you can really lean on it. And that's going to help so much when it comes to buoy turns, um, when it comes to just, you know, bumpy, choppy conditions, all those things. But the other thing too is when you're in that buoy turn, I'm sure you guys have seen many pictures of Connor and I where like, you know, you get off balance right at the back and you're fully braced leaning on that paddle. The reason why you haven't fallen in is because we have our paddle out there and we're ready to just like lean on it and it'll it'll support you for quite a quite a while it's your yeah. training wheels think of it as your training yeah. wheels you <laughs> utilize it as a brace when you're falling backwards you can slap the water or if your paddle's in the water like fiona said you have more surface area and mass around your blade your board and it's just going to keep you connected to the water i think those are really good steps for sure and if you're a taller person that's when I was saying the one big step, you know, it allows you to get in that surfer stance, Waimea, and then when you step forward, you can almost step forward right back to where your front foot is planted. So two little things, those are, those are all good things to keep in mind. And uh, biggest thing I know you would say probably the same is practice. I think getting out there on the water, running up and down your board, falling in, jumping on, practicing the buoy turns and not really being afraid for the people in 
Germany where it's 15 degrees, I'm sorry, but you got to just do it. <laughs> Starboard makes some really good um, all-star sup suits. That's true. I've had them those true. all winter here in Oregon, and they're a lifesaver, so you guys can go get some of those. But, you know, you're, you mentioned practice, Connor, and there's somebody in here who had a question. You know, they're, they're already an athlete for a bunch of different sports. Um, you know, what are some specific sup training things you can do? Um, you know, and – and when it comes to that, the biggest thing is time on the water and practice paddling. You know, that there's, you can always improve your technique, whether it be stroke, your stability, anything like that, but that doesn't come without being on the water. If you, you know, from sports, you're probably gonna have good balance, you're gonna have, you know, some good fitness, but stand up paddling is specific in the way where it just comes with time on the water, learning about techniques, trying different equipment, all that stuff. But yeah, through, through everything, you really, you can't replace time on the water with anything else to get better at specifically paddling. For sure. And over exaggerate it. Don't, don't need to be so like tender, like do it more than you would think. Do a big step, do a little step, do a big hop, like really playing around with it and over exaggerating these maneuvers and then under exaggerating it is going to allow you to find the happy medium of, okay, well, this board that I'm riding today, it only allows me to do X, Y, and Z. Whereas if I'm telling you to do this, because I'm on all-star with this equipment and this is what I do, it might not necessarily work for you. So trying over-exaggerating it, under-exaggerating it really will help you find the sweet spot for you particularly and what gear you're using. But uh, looking here at the top of the questions from Hungary, where we're gonna be very soon next year, um, following any breathing methods while uh, doing long distance racing. Um, biggest thing, not necessarily any pattern or particular thing I've been using. Biggest thing don't would be- Don't stop just, breathing. <laughs> yeah, don't stop breathing. That's really, <laughs> that's a great one. But no, just trying to breathe through your nose is a big thing. And I think uh, a lot of athletes in all different sports would say the, the same thing is uh, nose breathing is really gonna allow that oxygen get to your brain first and really you got all the nose hairs and all the filtrations and all those things that are helping you get a uh, better breath of air. So practicing off the water, of course, and on the water, put a sip of water in your mouth from your camel pack and see how long you can paddle without taking a breath through your mouth, only breathing through your nose, little things like that. And then off the water, there's all kinds of fun devices. One I've been using lately is called the AeroFit and that's a respiratory training device. And this is allowing you to 10 minutes, five minutes before your training, after your training, doesn't really matter. It's a, a breathing mechanism. So it's allowing you to follow a specific pattern, whether it's circle breathing, square breathing, exhale breathing. And uh, this is another thing to kind of step up your game off the water while you're traveling. The device is about this big. You've probably seen it on my profile on Instagram, but that's another great thing to level up your respiratory system. Absolutely. And the, the only thing else that I would add to that would be, well, okay, I guess two things, you know, if you feel at any point something cramping up, um, whether it be legs, long side stitch, anything like that, a big exhale, um, that'll help you get through that cramp. And the other thing is, you know, sometimes you get flustered when you're racing or sometimes, you know, you're in the midst of it, you're kind of all heated and everything's going. Um, it's not a big, bad idea to take a deep breath, you know, like take a deep breath, analyze the situation, obviously while you're still paddling, you know, look around and see where the draft train is. Are you in the right draft train? Take a deep breath and then decide and go. It can almost be like a little bit of a reset. Um, and also it's easy to get into a rhythm when you're paddling. It's easy to just kind of like, especially doing distance. If you're in a draft train, it's easy to be like, okay, we're doing this. And then you take a breath, create a plan and then go for it. Execute that plan. That's totally for sure. Looking at some of these other questions here on the side, uh, looks like another top one is from Portugal. And uh, they're saying, how far do you start race preparation? That's kind of a hard question in the sense, specifically, I mean, I've been paddling for the last 10 years and I consider all that time on the water and preparation has been preparing me for the race tomorrow or the race the next day. But to get a little more specific, Six months is a general good base you want to be working in those first two to three months, longer distance, slower pace, two hours on the water. And then once you get closer into the race day or racing that you're 
um, focusing on, whether it be sprinting or technical, or if it is distance, then starting to tune in, like Fiona was saying, seeing what your course is going to be, see what conditions you're going to be racing in, and um, kind of go off of that. For me and Fiona, our last race is in December, and then next race starting right back up in April. So we don't have a huge buffer on far as time off the water, and we kind of rolling into the next year. Michael guys and all the Australians, their season is starting during our off season. So, you know, that January time is when things kind of take a little break. February, March, things start to ramp back up. And then May, June, July is our big peak season. So that four to six months would be a good rule of thumb. You know, I think it's going to be really interesting this year because we've, we've had a year of no yeah. Um So I, you know, depending on what schedules get released here and how every, how the world works with COVID and vaccines and travel restrictions and everything like that, I really think that whenever we start racing, um, which is a little bit hard, you know, I'm definitely aiming for the ICF uh, World Championships in Hungary, which is June. So that's kind of what I'm going to be backing my six months up to, um, which is starting to train January, um, ending end of January. And, you know, when we say starting to train, we're not necessarily like saying, oh, we're starting from scratch because we've been training this whole time. Um, I know Connor, you've, um, spending a lot of time on your board. I have been too. I've been doing a lot of other, um, off the water things to just, you know, keep myself yeah. excited and going through these difficult times, but it is really going to show, um, you know, and I know a lot of Europeans too have been able to race during this whole, during COVID. Um, whereas Connor and I haven't, uh, I think you're on your first trip right now. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's going to, I think there's going to be a huge mental side coming into it. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's going to be cool because maybe for one time we actually will have a training block to prepare for, you know, Euro Tour and ICF uh, World Championships, which uh, normally we're exhausted, uh, from the last year when we start training for the next year. So I think it'll, I think it'll be a good, um, a good chance to really, uh, put some solid hours in. For sure. No, that's, uh, definitely exciting because last year, for instance, it was huge training blocks, getting ready for the year. And then it was like, okay, that event's canceled, but don't worry. I'm going to keep training, keep going, keep going. And then that event was canceled. So then it got to a point where like, okay, Time to put the race board away. Let's have some fun. Give the body a rest. Maui, there's always surf or wind or something to go find to stay active, like Fiona said. So there's not a huge amount of downtime. And like the question we answered in the beginning, cross training is just as important because you're working different muscles that you wouldn't necessarily utilize in paddling. And you're keeping a fresh mindset. So when you jump back on the board, it's fun. It's something different. It's not something you've been doing for the last two weeks, uh, two to three times a day. Hey, there's one question that popped up here that I think is actually a really cool question to answer. And that's from um, Rory McGuire. And she said, is there, such a, is there such a thing as a bad day on the water? And um, I feel like that question very much has a yes and no answer. You know, I've had super tough days on the water and just come off the water and be like, man, that was hard or, you know, things didn't go to plan or the, for me, the bad day could be a scary situation um, or an unsafe situation. But at the same time, you know, anytime you come off the water and you either were frustrated or it was tough or whatever happened, I try and take a look at it and be like, okay, sure, that was frustrating or it didn't go to plan. Um, even with a race, you know, I've had some races where I, I just didn't do as well as I wanted to do. And that's super frustrating because all that preparation, everything that goes into it, it's like, yes, that could be a bad day on the water, but what am I going to learn from that day to not do that again? Yeah. And as hard as it is to think about it because really what you want to do is just forget about that. Like I did terrible at this race. I don't want to deal with it again. But the most important thing is to look at it, listen to it, learn from it, and then not do it next time. For sure. I think that's a really key point, whether it's a race or a training day or just a fun day is, I mean, when you come off the water and you had the best time of your life, you're not really thinking about, okay, what can I do to make myself better? Or what can I do to not have that happen again? Whereas some of the hardest days and some of the toughest losses you've had 
are the times you come back to the drawing board and you're like, okay, what did I do wrong? What can I do to improve in this area versus a win or a great day on the water? You're kind of just rolling into the next, you know, you're not thinking about necessarily what you can do to improve yourself. You're thinking about, oh, that was fun. That was great. And all these things, which is incredible. We would live for those moments, but the bad days are what define us and make us stronger. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we're running towards the end of our time. Um, so maybe Connor and Fiona to finish off, if you both want to just have a bit of a look through the questions there and uh, we'll pick out a couple. Yeah, I, got, I got one question. I looks like kind of towards me and Tressel wants to answer that one too. It sounds like, <laughs> um, I was, uh, I'm just going to read it. It was just saying he's surprised basically to see top athletes like myself being rather lean versus your guys' industry, the sprint canoe racers, tend to be a little bulkier, like uh, Andre the Giant, <laughs> who we saw us paddling at a million miles per hour. Um, you know, I think it's, we're still such a new sport, and we're still trying to find what kind of athletes SUP really is looking for. For instance, in the beginning, we were doing all races, 200 meters, 32 miles, didn't matter what we had to do at all. We had to be versatile in all the conditions versus now you're seeing a lot more athletes uh, get a little more in tune to just one specific division and in that sense I think it's definitely going to slowly start moving towards the bulkier paddlers of course when you look at endurance or the marathon side of things you see the more lean lengthier kind of type of body structure so for now I'm going to run with it and keep uh, Andre on his on his heels <laughs> as long as I can until until he's beating me. But I think there's a lot of strength and a lot of stuff that comes out of technique and just time on the water on these specific boards that is gonna trump muscle over anything. You know, you can be pulling a hard stroke, but if you're not letting your board release and glide correctly or maintaining the board on the top of the surface on a planing sense, because a lot of these canoers are used to displacement hauls, their boats are in the water, not on top of the water. Um, it's going to take them a little bit to kind of figure those things out, but muscle and all those things are going to come into play once they figure out their technique and the equipment. Absolutely. I think that, you know, it's just super important time on the water and testing your gear. You know, it takes a moment to figure it all out. Um, here's a, <laughs> here's a good, oh, here's a good question. Um, from JP Ipolito, and it kind of goes into all, the, it ties in everything that we were talking about. And he says, with paddleboarding being relatively new to the scene, how should paddlers prepare, prepare for that level of nutrition and physical training? Running, cycling, swimming, all require the use of different muscles and fuel for your body. I know there is not one size fits all, but is there a standard to which an athlete can measure against in regards to the physical and nutrition balance for paddleboarding? I think that, you know, that's a big question. And we kind of yeah. touched, uh, we touched on those things throughout, you know, this webinar quite a few times. But to answer it specifically, I think, well, I think it actually is very difficult to answer that, you know, question specifically because stand-up paddling is such a new sport. And I do take a lot of the training that I do from cycling um, because they do a lot of different um, well, there's a lot of similarities when it comes to racing techniques in terms of draft trains, um, you know, working in a pack and, and stuff like that, um, you know, and, and runners and swimmers definitely have specific training schedules and nutrition plans that go along with them. You know, with paddling, we are, with stand-up paddling, we're an interesting mix of um, surfers that have come in and then you have um, more endurance athletes from say the running side and then you have windsurfers and you know now we have a major influx of canoe paddling and so that's the cool part about stand-up paddling is it all comes from different breeds you know there's a whole lot of different people connor you just mentioned it you know in terms of physique um everybody is slightly different and so it is going to take time to figure out exactly I don't actually believe that there is one um, equation that means good stand-up paddler um, in terms of fitness and nutrition and um, technique, because we've seen that there are many different um, body types, many different nutrition plans, different boards that have all proven to be on the top of the podium. Um, 
But that being said, there's a lot that you can focus on within yourself. And I think that is the most important. You know, you need to figure out what works well for you, what food makes you feel good for that day on that race. Um, you know, talk with somebody, talk with either um, a trainer who has uh, knowledge and nutrition and can work with you one on one. Um, you know, ask other athletes questions. Um, you know, to give you guys a little bit more like personal perspective, when Connor and I train and um, go on trips together or stay together for races, we're constantly just bantering about, oh yeah, I tried this food, or oh yeah, I had this recovery thing, or oh my God, this was my training thing, and oh, it was terrible, or oh, this works super good. You know, it's those conversations because, you know, it, it gets you excited too. So JP, to answer your question exactly, I don't think I can do that. But I can say that there's a lot of things that you can do to improve and take from other sports too. You know, the more you know about the way different athletes train, um, the better you're going to be to be able to address the situation you're training for. So. Be like a sponge, soak it all up and then utilize what works for you. I don't think there is a one size fit all. Definitely not. But as our sport evolves, as ICF, uh, plays a bigger role in our sport and having a fantastic world championships like in China, I think we are going to slowly start seeing more and more one size fit all like, okay, this guy is a sprinter. This guy is a marathon paddler. But up until then, you know, like right now, I'm still doing the marathons. We're still doing the sprinting technical. So we're doing it all. And then we're having to fit in okay, before a distance race, I'm going to eat a little more high fats. And then before a sprint race, I'm going to eat more carbs. So playing a role of figuring out what works for what race, what works for you, all these little key things is uh, really important. Tuning into your body and your um, understanding of it. Absolutely. All right. Uh, any other questions that have caught your eye? We've got about five minutes to go guys if you uh, want to wrap it up if there's anything else here that jumps out a lot of questions there thank you everybody we've got about yeah lots of questions appreciate it all this is uh this is great uh it looks like mike that's a pretty common uh problem everyone's having right there and it's saying how to improve his stroke on his less dominant side so that's a really uh technical question in the sense there's no real specific answer okay paddle like this to make it work something i've involved in a lot of my training and the lower pace days, when I'm doing more base work, 70%, 75%, it gets a little bit monotonous, but I'm counting my strokes. So I'm doing six to 10 strokes on my left side, which would be my strong side. And then I'm trying to do 10 to 15 strokes on my left strong side, my right side, to try to you know, help that imbalance and paddling on that side. When I'm at home or in the gym, I'm working that right side a little bit more. I'm working the less dominant side on land and on the water when I have the time during trainings. Because when it comes to competition, 200 meter sprint, I don't even paddle once on my right side. So it's, it's hard to say. So if you're doing distance stuff, it's really important to try to switch around and have both sides really strong. Because when you're paddling on your weak side, you might lose, like you said, 0.5 miles per hour slower. Also, you might tend to go to the left a bit more, to the right. You can't stay in a straight line as well. And the biggest thing would be just paddling on that other side when you have the time, when you're not specifically doing a four-minute piece by six minutes times whatever it is. Uh, go on those days when you're doing more base work, paddle an extra five strokes on your weak side will help maybe strengthen that a bit. Absolutely. And I think here's a good question to uh, end it off with, and it's from Gemma. And she asks, do you have to have a race board to race? And the easy answer is absolutely not. You know, when you're starting off at the beginning, take whatever you can to get yourself out on that race course. You know, even if it's a big thing that was, you know, under your garage or um, in your house or something like that, doesn't matter, but just get out there. Um, you know, and as you, as you improve, as you push yourself more and more, then yes, then it's time to like, you know, start looking for a race board. But don't, I wouldn't say, don't limit your introduction to the sport just because you don't have the right board for the right race. 
um, you can paddle anything on the water and it's really fun to be a part of it, you know, and that goes to say too, if you don't have, you know, a flat water board for a flat water race, you have a bumpy board for, um, you know, a flat water race, that's totally fine, but get out there, have fun on the race course and just, you know, become more part of the community. It's, it's fun to, it's fun to be out there with a lot of people and it sure is motivating. It makes me want to go back out there every race I do. Yeah, I think that's really important. You know, definitely don't limit yourself, whether it's you don't have a race board or a specific race board, just getting out there. I know a lot of races too, so doing research is important. I believe at the ICF in China, they had inflatable boards for people to try and actually sign up and do the race. So all you literally had to do is show up. They had a paddle, a board, and more and more races are doing this. The Paris Boat Show, you sign up, your entry, Starboard has a big a uh, lot of boards for you to borrow and do the race. It shows up at the start line and then you give it off on the, the finish line. And that's a great way to get into the sport. Hey, I really love this. I want to do this more. I'm going to buy a board or, hey, you know what? This is not me. I'm just going to stick to, you know, the casual paddling around my lake or by my house. And it just allows you to get that experience being involved with, you know, 100 plus paddlers on the water and, uh, you know, pushing your limits. Absolutely. The more people in the water, the more fun it is. And I can't wait till we get to do an event like this. And, you know, Colin and I get to be there in person and we get to, you know, chat longer, um, see you all. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and then go paddling together. That'll yeah. be really nice, though. Thank everybody, you all for being here today. Everybody just can't wait to get back out there. And, uh, hopefully it'll happen soon. And, um, Connor, you mentioned what we did in China. The plan is that we're going to do the same thing in Hungary. We'll have development camps for people who are new to the sport. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, so many people took that opportunity in China and we hope they'll do the same thing in, in Hungary. Uh, pencil the dates in, everyone. June 18th to the 20th, the ICF World Championships in beautiful Balanturenburg in Hungary. Um, it's going to be fantastic there. We did a site visit last week and uh, we came away with just our um, minds were blown by how excited they are to host the event. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, look, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, Fiona and Connor both, by the way, offer personal coaching. Uh, just go to their social media handles and you can find out all the information. And they've got so much information that you can tap into. So experienced. And my goodness, they're very, very good at putting complex uh, descriptions in very, very easy to follow way. So thank you both of you for being very patient with us today. It's been really, really good. Um, we recorded today's session, so we'll be posting that online in the next couple of days. Please share it, everybody, and, and direct your friends to it. Who, uh, as, as both Connor and Fiona mentioned, and especially during lockdown, stand-up paddling has been one of the success stories of the international pandemic because um, paddleboard manufacturers around the world are saying they're struggling to keep up with demand for people who have seen this sport and want to get out and try it when they've basically can't do anything else at the moment and they're loving it so it's a real success story that this sport is really taking off so um great to have so many guys like you giving your time up uh we've got a couple more webcasts coming up we've got uh world champions michael booth and sonny homeshell joining us and uh the master coach larry kane will be uh running his own webinar for us in a couple of weeks time so we're looking forward to having uh, him on board as well a lot of love Guys, for you both on the chat lines today, everyone's been really, really excited and found a lot. We're sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but what we might do is we'll get a copy of those and maybe uh, Connor and Fiona, if you get a chance, uh, you might be able to answer some of those online or something. Totally. Yeah. Because yeah. as we said, there are a lot of people tuning in who are quite new to the sport or just want to tap into the minds of some world champions and <laughs> find out how they can become world champions themselves. That's what we did as kids and you know that's what we're still doing up until this day always searching and whether it's in our sport or out of our sport um, you know people that are on the top of their game you know it's it's always good to dive into their mind see what they do see what they do differently and whether it's one tip two tips three tips or nothing you know you learn something not to do or to do so it's always good. <laughs> Absolutely and you can always reach out to us too you know don't be, don't hesitate to send us a message on Instagram or through Facebook and, um, you know, we'll try and get back to as many of them as we can. So, uh, yeah, we, I think it's important to keep communication open and, you know, as stand up paddling is 
a very fastly growing sport. It's cool to be involved with it, hear how you guys are training, getting into it, all of that. So yeah, don't be afraid to reach out. Someone did ask the question, is it going to be an Olympic sport? We all hope so. We all hope so. Fingers crossed. Yep, yep. Uh, (laughs) The more people we can get doing the sport, the more chance uh, the IOC will look at it and think, wow, we need to have this on board. So uh, encourage your friends to get out there on a board and start paddling. Come (laughs) join us. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thanks, guys. Uh, If anyone has any topics they would like for future webinars, by the way, uh, our sub-coordinator at the ICF, Hoi Shan Kwan, has put his email address on the uh, chat line. Drop us a line if you've got specific topics you'd like us to discuss in future webinars. Connor, Fiona, I'm going to let you go to your Sunday afternoons in the States. Enjoy yourselves. Thanks so much, guys. Hopefully, we'll see you out on the water soon. To everyone else, thank you for joining us on this Sunday. We hope you've all picked up something useful out of this. I'm sure you have.